right to vote. A panel of judges say former felons should be able to vote in Florida. The governor will appeal that. Will former felons who still owe fines and fees be able to vote this year? Roger has a very good chance of exoneration, in my opinion. Thumb on the scale? Tweets, pardons, and commutations. The president moves to mitigate the consequences of criminal behavior. Two South Florida prosecutors weigh in. And according to three networks in the AP, we have now won the Nevada caucus. Big win for Bernie. Senator Bernie Sanders takes the Nevada caucuses by a landslide. Is he now unstoppable? We'll take the state of the race to the roundtable. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin today with a court decision this week involving former felons' right to vote and a fight that could add a significant number of voters to the rolls this election year. On Wednesday, a federal appeals court ruled that former felons who cannot pay their fines and fees cannot be denied the right to vote. Governor Ron DeSantis asked the entire court to keep that ban in place while he goes ahead with his appeal. Either way, the win for the 17 former felons who brought the case gives hope to some million and a half others and raises questions about who will be able to participate in the November elections. And that is where we begin with Neil Volz, deputy director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, the group behind the passage of Amendment 4 two years ago and now leading the charge against the financial rules that bind it. So great to you have you here and a little bit of traveling to get here so we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having us and for shining a light on this issue. Well it's a huge issue and only a million and a half former felons are waiting to see how it is going to be decided. So this three panel uh, uh, judges in the 11th Circuit in Atlanta, this ruling is in your favor and against the governor and the legislature but beyond the 17 plaintiffs in the case, who's affected? Well, it, it really it impacts the 17 plaintiffs. And if I could just let you know, I'm, I'm a returning citizen, so I'm somebody who got my uh, voting rights restored. Our organization is not a party to the case, but we are actively working with returning citizens all across the right. state. And we can tell you that we're cautiously optimistic about this case, but we know that there's a long way to go. And we're seeing a little bit of a roller coaster take place yeah. in terms of how returning citizens are processing this information. Right. You know, very interesting that you are not party to the case. And that brings up something that that I find really fascinating is that this has become such a politicized issue. Why is it so politicized when it really affects Democrats and Republican former felons in the very same way? Well, yeah, we know that returning citizens, people with past felony convictions in the state of Florida represent all walks of life, represent all communities. And when I think about this movement that we've been on, I think about where it started. It really started, you know, from the bottom up with family members of returning citizens signing petitions and and nobody you know in, in that moment was thinking about partisan politics but when you start talking about elections and you, you start you know moving this thing forward it, it becomes a byproduct and honestly yeah. it, it, it it makes us feel sad sometimes because the spirit of amendment four transcended you know yeah. right or left it was really about just people being people and well, loving their neighbors and their friends 65 percent of Floridians said yes we believe those who have served their sentences want to rejoin society fully should be able to vote. So there were Republicans, Democrats, Independents who voted for this. That's exactly right. This was a grassroots movement that enjoyed support from the right, the left, from all over the state, and was really founded on a simple premise that, you know, when a debt's paid, it's paid, and that uh, elected officials were not on the ballot with Amendment 4. It was really our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, and we saw this overwhelming support for this concept of second chances. Yeah. Well, that for everyone who doesn't really follow this in the weeds, I mean, Amendment 4 ha was implemented by a a statute created by lawmakers, and that's kind of what is so controversial. But the financial component of a sentence that needs to be satisfied includes the court costs and fees, which now many uh, county jurisdictions are trying to find a way around, but it also involves restitution. And restitution is not part of this controversy, because if, if a former felon owes restitution to a victim, 
that is, that's got to be paid. That's not part of this. Yeah, I, I know when I think about traveling all over the state, those of us who are helping to communicate about Amendment 4, we talked about the power of restitution and being made whole in our community. You know, I, I created a breach in my community. Mm -hmm. And for me to move forward in a healthy way with my community, I need to make sure that uh, that breach has been filled. And so what we're engaged in right now is a big conversation about what it means to complete your sentence and then how people can become yeah. eligible to vote. Yeah. Neil, as far as I can tell, there is kind of a bit of a, a checkerboard effect in the state. There are counties like Miami-Dade where uh, the state attorney and in Broward as well, maybe in uh, Orange County as well, have tried to say, all right, you can't pay your fees. Come in, we'll work out a deal where you can do community service. Mm -hmm. You can pay off that money over time, as it were. But this is not uniform in the state. No, that's right. If you think about how we got here, right? So Amendment 4 passed and that ended the lifetime ban for people with felony convictions from voting. Then the legislature passed a law that provided relief, that gave, gave us tools to use with local courtrooms. And that's right. uh, what we're doing is working with a variety of different judicial districts to seek relief for returning yeah. citizens who want to have access and, and full participation. And excuse me. And your group also, I have read, has raised what, half a million dollars, and you have gone ahead and paid off some of the fines and fees for some former felons, don't know how many. Yeah, we have a fines and fees fund, and it's really amazing to see the community come together to help people. So hundreds of people have had their fines and fees paid off through our fines and fees fund, and everywhere we go, we bring up the fines and fees fund in case somebody wants to donate. I, I want to go back to sort of the political ramifications of this. Uh, roughly a million and a half former felons is the number I've seen in the narrative involved. And, and the, the push and pull of this is, I mean, this came down one day too late for anyone to register for the primaries. Right, right. So, but, you know, November is still out there. And, and I think the prevailing conversation is, well, here's a million and a half people who can, you know, a fraction of that can sway a Florida vote. We all know that. But, but practically speaking, has, has your organization really looked at well, how many people really are going to register to vote? Isn't this sort of reflective of, of the population where there's some very engaged people but some not very engaged people who won't. Well, I think that's a really good question, and I think we, we know that tens of thousands of uh, past uh, people with past felony convictions have registered to vote. They represent a, a broad background of people, um, and folks that I get to spend so much time with, you know, what I like to say is there's no one who's a better evangelist for democracy than somebody who lost the right to vote yeah. and got it back. So we have yeah. people really excited, and we're going to see, you know, over time uh, yeah. how many people come out and what, what the ultimate impact yeah. is. But one yeah. thing we do know is, is that the shifts the conversation around the issues and that is by bringing these new voters on we're starting to see more conversations around uh, public safety criminal justice reform and we think that that's a really yeah. healthy thing for our communities. And Neil bring us up to date there were thousands of former felons who when amendment 4 passed went into their elections departments and signed up and said I'm qualified to vote and it is illegal to cast the vote if you are not a qualified elector and now it appears that maybe some of them aren't. So what is your advice to those people? Well, we get phone calls every day, and I get text messages. I got one from yesterday from a friend of mine who went through the process, who's, who you know, has paid all his fines and fees and registered to vote. So we encourage people, you need to do your due diligence, give a good faith effort, make sure that you're, 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 you're registered on the, the right way. And we do know that there have been other people who have registered. And our, yeah. our job is, is to wait and see what, what are people getting back from their supervisors right. and then respond accordingly. That's yeah. actually good advice for everybody yeah. who votes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> and the final point I would make, of course, is in April, April in Tallahassee, federal judge Robert Henkel is going to hear the trial in this case on Amendment 4. No, that's exactly right. We know there's quite a few steps still to go, including the Hinkle case. Some people mention this going into the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. Um, for us, it turns into a little bit of a roller coaster because yeah. as you get excited when you see the headline right. and you're happy for the 17 plaintiffs, but you know that friends and neighbors who are waiting and hoping to be yeah. full participants in the community, that they're still waiting right now. And, and our organization is committed to any returning citizen who wants to have access to the, the, the voting booth that we will walk with them and, and, and try and create avenues of um, opportunity for them. Neil Volz, thanks so much for coming you, in Neil. and stay tuned, as they say. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.
All right, up next, two former federal prosecutors are going to weigh in on the Roger Stone sentencing and the fact that the president has put himself right in the middle of it. Once again, there is a Florida connection to a big national story. The president tweeted about, yes, Broward resident Roger Stone's sentence, commuted the sentences of 11 white collar criminals, including that of Miami Dade's Judith Negron, and he also declared himself the nation's chief law enforcement officer. The president unleashed a storm of tweets blasting the prosecutors in the Roger Stone case, and he criticized the judge as well and said that the juror four woman uh, was biased. He supports a new trial for Roger Stone, his longtime friend and advisor. President's words set off shockwaves among current and former federal prosecutors. Some 2,000 of them signed a letter saying the president needs to butt out of the criminal justice system and that William Barr should resign. Two former South Florida prosecutors are here with us to talk all about it. Kendall Coffey served as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District under President Bill Clinton, and he is now in private practice. David Weinstein spent about 11 years as an assistant U.S. attorney here and is also now in private practice. Once prosecutors, still attorneys. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good Hello. morning. David, Good morning. Kendall, great to have you here. Well, I need not say you are excellent lawyers that the president of the United States historically has stayed out of comedy on pending or current trials, even trials once they've taken place often. But David Weinstein here, the president, you know, as soon as the prosecutor said, Seven to nine years for Roger Stone, bang. There he was saying, that's too much. These prosecutors are horrible. The juror, the lead forewoman is biased. I mean, just inserted himself right into this. What did you think? That doesn't help. It doesn't help the people on the line, the people who are standing in front of the district court judge asking for an appropriate sentence and looking to do what's just and right in the prosecution they've just undertaken. The president doesn't know all of the facts that are involved in the case as it was put together in the trial as it occurred in the courtroom and to jump in and make those judgments and make those statements on a huge national platform yeah. really sets a bad precedent for those people who are in court trying to make sure the right thing is done. Right. You know, Judge Amy Berman Jackson, Kendall Coffey, had said uh, after the new memo came out from the, um, from the prosecutor's office, she said that didn't matter, that she was going to rule the way she was going to rule seven to nine years as a guideline, he got roughly half. I know everyone talks about it in months, but it is three and a half years. How, how unusual really is that? Well, I expect judges to do just what she did, which is somehow eliminate all the noise from everybody, even looking past the papers of the prosecutors and the defense lawyers, who after all have clients to represent, and trying to get it right. And when you look at comparable sentences over the years, she pretty much seemed to have got it right. I was, I was thinking about uh, Scooter Libby. We all remember mm -hmm. him. He got 30 months, and in some ways his crime was worse. In some ways it wasn't as bad. But you look at his 30 months, you look at Stone's 40 month, I think you've got a great example of what our, our federal judges do to make us so proud. They ignore it all, and they follow the law. Okay, yeah. well, well, that said then, what, what does it matter that the president weighed in? Again, it creates this impression that there is no autonomy for the people who are working in the executive department. Now, I understand that the separation of powers doctrine works between the three branches of government, but within the Department of Justice and within that executive branch, normally there's not this heavy-handed uh, play going into what's taking right. place. Yeah. Well, well, you saw a cause and effect moment, maybe, uh, Kendall, because after the president tweeted, it was the next morning that the uh, prosecutors, new prosecutors, went before Judge Berman and said, forget our seven to nine year recommendation, sentence Roger Stone to whatever you want. And William Barr later that day, in fact, in an interview with ABC News said, oh, that didn't influence me. I wasn't doing what the president wanted. But there is a perception that maybe he was. Well, and that's what the big problem is here. When, when these tweets are undermining the perception of justice, and that's all important. The reason so many prosecutors uh, took very strong, an unprecedented statement, yeah. is the idea of political meddling crawling inside the Department of Justice, which, right. which all of us who have had the privilege of serving really view as an ultimate institution of integrity. The fact of somebody trying to pull puppet strings on that yeah. is horrifying. And that's why you saw the reaction. Right. And that's why I think the Attorney General needs to do more 
in terms of communicating with so the offices. Does independence? It, well, communicate directly around the field. Maybe it's a goodwill tour, but he needs to make sure that he's not taking orders from Donald Trump about cases in our justice system. So, so this week, the president said, I am the chief law enforcement officer. He is the commander in chief. I, I, is that legitimate? Is he? I mean, it sounds like it could be legitimate. I don't think he is. I and think there's the statutes that say that the chief federal law enforcement is the attorney general. And be, let's all keep in mind, the vast majority of crimes are prosecuted by state authorities, none of whom are on Kathy Rundle. They're not answerable to the president of the United States. So yeah, he gets to pick the attorney general of the United States. The attorney general of the United States is the chief federal law enforcement And officer. that's the person who should be in charge of enforcing federal laws. He may be asked by the president to give his or her opinion mm -hmm. about a particular incident that occurred, but it's important that the opinion that's being asked is not about one that's politically based in nature, but rather a legal opinion. And that's something that the president could ask and something the attorney general should do. Getting back to the effect of, of what's going on here, look, as a career or former career prosecutors, one of the things we know is that the attorney general may change, the U.S. attorney may change, but the people who are in court yeah. defending the Constitution, they're going to remain the same. So you need to have rank and file unity and you need to have people that are supported by whomever the attorney general might be. You know, I would point out that uh, a friend of ours, collectively, individually, Bob Martinez, former U.S. attorney in Miami back in the uh, 1990s, uh, wrote an op-ed piece this week in the Miami Herald in which he defended the integrity of William Barr because Barr was then the attorney general under George Herbert Walker Bush when Bob Martinez was the uh, U.S. attorney here. And here's what Bob wrote. Even though he had defended William Barr, he said it was wrong, unjustified, under any circumstances, and dangerous for Trump to say anything about the Stone prosecution, prosecutors, the sentencing, the presiding judge, or any juror. That's pretty strong. And then he went on to say his attacks undermine the integrity of professional law enforcement, the rule of law, and judicial independence. That's putting it out there. Couldn't put it better. None of us could put it any better than that. He's absolutely right about that. The independence is what's important. The judge needs to be independent. And she, in this case, none of us like the guidelines. They're there as a guide. And she used that guide to fashion a reasonable sentence. I want to get a, a prosecutor's eye view on the commutations and uh, pardons mm -hmm. that the president needed this week. 11 people, uh, some really big names and controversial people, and some sort of obscure you know, no disrespect intended, obscure women, one of whom lives in our community. When a prosecutor sees that sentence being taken away, reduced drastically, what, what does that feel like? What do you think about that? In, in a lot of cases, it's demoralizing, uh, especially if it's a, a drastic revision of what seemed to be a just mm -hmm. result and a just sentence. Well, the... the I don't want to put words in the president's mouth, but the president said it was not a just sentence. It was, in many cases, extreme sentence. Everybody's entitled to have their opinion. And again, the guidelines is what came into play here. They artificially created a very severe sentence for all of these people. And the yeah. judge corrected it to some degree and gave them potentially less than the sentence that was required under the guidelines. I think the bigger message is one of Negron's co-conspirators who pled guilty he's still doing his full sentence, mm -hmm. which was significantly larger than hers. She went to trial, was found guilty by jurors, and then was sentenced. So what sort of message does that yeah. send to people who stepped up and accepted their responsibility? Although the reverse is true as well. In another state, at about that same time, there were Medicare fraud uh, convictions where the people who were found guilty served or were sentenced to far fewer years, and in one case, uh, probation. And, you know, I don't know the details of that case, but on, on face value, they look very similar. You have to get into the details. There clearly had to be something that differentiated those people who were sentenced to probation from people who received some severe prison time and incarceration, sure. whether it was the money, whether it was what was yeah. involved, their conduct. Every case is different. Yeah. Kendall Coffey, great to see you, Thanks my friend. Great. David Weinstein, good to, have you here. good to have you come in. Up next, we're taking all the week's hot topics right to the round table. Stay tuned. It has been another momentous week in the news, one big story after another. So right now, 
We want to take a closer, more analytical look at a few of those stories with our Powerhouse Roundtable. And as always, we have a great one for you that crosses the spectrum of political points of view. Ed Pozzuoli is president of the Trip Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale and active in the Republican Party, both nationally and locally. Stephen Johnson chairs Miami-Dade County's Black Affairs Advisory Board. He is an attorney with the Lidecker Diaz firm. Fernand Amandi is a professional pollster and a political analyst. He leaves the Ben Dixon Amandi firm in Coconut Grove. Welcome all. Gentlemen, I'm sorry Thank there's you. no women here today. I'm sorry. You there will are represent. No women the, here today. You were gender here. <laughs> I think uh, you can do it. I say so, this, it's even. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best compliment I get right. today. Well, well done, Ed. All right, so let's begin obviously with the Nevada caucuses and Fernand. Uh, Forty-six percent for Senator Bernie Sanders. I mean, this was a blowout victory. Uh, what does this say about where he stands in the race? It says that uh, Bernie Sanders today, Michael, is the unquestioned front runner of the Democratic Party. And until other Democratic contenders start winning primaries, he's, uh, he's right now in poll position and certainly where you want to be if you were leading one of the campaigns for the Democratic candidates. Uh, it's a moment, I think, of concern for a lot of folks around the country that why, want... Why concern? Because Bernie Sanders, a, an avowed socialist, who over the course of his life has expressed uh, praise for a lot of dictators and leaders, especially knowing us here in South Florida, mm -hmm. how problematic that can be. Yeah. And I think, Michael, the facts are Robert Mueller concluded in his investigation that there were two campaigns in 2016 that the Russians were actively trying to assist Donald Trump's campaign and Bernie Sanders. And we learned last week, again, the Russians are trying to infiltrate, right. according to our intelligence communities, right. the, the Trump Sanders. and Sanders campaign. Okay, yeah. so if, if that's the case, they haven't yet, and still Bernie Sanders is in the poll position, is the leader. Uh, three states, a long way to go, but momentum is there, but, but it's not because of the Russians. No, well, I would say, it, particularly last night, it was because of Latino voters, and their message is hitting home particularly with Mexican-Americans. It's interesting to note because while I don't think that will translate to South Florida, I will tell you, you've got Texas, you've got California, you're going to see some further tests of whether or not his message is actually going to translate to those voters. If he can create a coalition of voters uh, where you have Hispanic-Americans and you have young people and you have socialists, I don't know if that gets you to the plurality needed to beat Donald Trump at all. In fact, I, I, I'm fearful as a Democrat, but it might get you what you need to go into the convention and come out the nominee. Yeah. Ed? Ed, well, yeah, weigh in. I'm fearful as a, an American that we would actually put a socialist uh, on a ticket of a major party in this country because, as we know, anything can happen in, in a November election. And so from that standpoint, I'm concerned because... Uh, while we don't always agree, the first part of what you said, I totally agree with. I, I think that he is an avowed socialist. People need to understand what that means. This is somebody who has, uh, hun he honeymooned in Moscow, for crying out loud. Yeah. Uh, who and does he went that? to Nicaragua. Went to Nicaragua, hung out with, hung out with the Sandinistas. Right, I mean, I mean, he was uh, yeah. uh, effusive with his compliment of the Castro. Castro was he? I mean, this is, this is somebody who, at least with respect to my view, is outside of the realm of American, the American political spectrum. But, so However, he's winning for two reasons. One, organization. You cannot be uh, unimpressed as a political yeah. person looking at it. The organization that he showed in, in, in uh, yeah. Nevada was substantial. I think you're going to see that again come Super Tuesday. And I don't think uh, that right now there is anybody who is uh, going to resist. And the issue for the Democrats is, is this where their party is? And I think this is where their party is, because if you look at what mm. Bernie did in Nevada, and if you look at even Elizabeth Warren's support, you are looking at the fringe left of American political spectrum. You can't really say that, because if you look in aggregate, you see all of the candidates who are considered to be moderate candidates, yeah. and there's four and a half of them are uh. splitting a much larger yeah, I don't consider vote. Pete right. Buttigieg is a moderate candidate. But, that, that was a half. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> less than a half. But, but look, the bottom line is that Bernie Sanders is going to be the nominee um, on, on this Democratic Party as we sit today. I think about a, a month or so ago, everybody laughed when I think I sat at, at where Stephen was sitting 
and I said, watch out for Bernie Sanders. Organization is going to get yeah. him the nomination. I, I, I will stipulate to that, Counselor. You know, uh, you are, Fernand, a professional pollster, mm -hmm. and I am simply a political reporter. But all for all the reasons that you all have enumerated, I look forward to March 17th. And I think if Bernie Sanders were to win the Florida primary, there is no way that he would win in November. I think Donald Trump would win Florida easily. I mean, as, as terrifying as that, that is a thought as someone who's an American before anything else, I tend to agree with you. And I think part of the reason, Michael, is people say, well, look at Bernie in the head-to-heads now against Trump. No. He's beating him by, in some cases, double digits. The problem is Bernie Sanders has not been vetted before a national audience. And when those clips start coming out about him saying how great Fidel Castro was and how great socialism right. is and how wonderful it was to spend time in the Soviet Union during his honeymoon, those are disqualifying things for a lot of American voters. But they are. The issue, though, we're running into is the, the millennials and the Generation Zs don't remember any of the Cold War. So for mm -hmm. them, it's all esoteric. Yeah. We're fighting over something that doesn't matter. However, for everyone older, and particularly uh, for that 55-year-old voter who makes up the base of everything, yeah. oh, that's going to matter a lot. You but know you what, this, there, I observe on the campaign trail something very similar between Bernie Sanders oh, okay. and Donald Trump from mm -hmm. four years ago mm -hmm. in their ground game. I mean, I don't, totally different people, different policies, different politics. But the energy, the ground game, their ability to pull in masses and absolutely control the masses narrative is very familiar. Yeah, and I think that's, the, that's the, they're, Bernie is tapping into a frustration in a certain sense and, and a different part of the electorate for sure than Trump, but clearly there's some similarity on that, on that count. The one thing that was disappointing, at least if you're a Democrat, was that Mike Bloomberg took the stage this past week in a yeah. debate and really laid a big egg. I mean, literally looked like he was not prepared. He, the, the perception of him on the debate stage did not match, come anywhere near what you yeah. saw, what his impression was on the commercials. You mean on the $400 million he oh had spent God. on media? All right, <laughs> yeah. let's hold your we'll thoughts. we right got to come back, go. talk about that uh, Wednesday night debate with the round table, stay with us. Welcome back to a very lively roundtable <laughs> with our friends Ed Pizzoli, Fernando Mandi, and Stephen Johnson. Stephen, Ed, I think, probably was correct when he said, maybe a little hyperbole, but he said Michael Bloomberg on Wednesday night laid an egg. I guess my question to you would be, he had to know questions were coming about stop and frisk, about the non-disclosure agreements with women who he had offended with comments or maybe actions, but he just blew those answers. He did, but let's be honest, it was sort of, hey, let's start the debate. Okay, let's blow you up. It, he didn't get a chance to warm up. But he knew that was coming. It was definitely coming. Second half, he actually settled in, and he had real answers and real ways he to... He was better in the second yes, half. To, to create for himself a, uh, a distance, a different point of view than Bernie Sanders. Look, listen, capitalism is what works in this country. Explaining it on a debate stage might be a little tough, particularly when mm -hmm. Bernie's, voting for Bernie is sort of the equivalent of a college kid who uh, wears a Che Guevara shirt. It seems cool, but is it really the right thing to do? But that, That's that, kind of where we are right now. That debate stage, though, going back until you know, before I was born, has been such a place of style and substance, and you can't take away the fact that style and presence and first impressions mean so much, mm -hmm. Fernand. Uh, you know, he gets another chance. And, well, and on this Tuesday week, night. And, and you can yeah. see, you know, Mr. Polster, I saw the sort of his numbers go down, yeah. except with Republicans who really liked to see his numbers go down. So they went up. But what, what do you, I mean, how bad was well, this? Well, you know, having, having worked on several presidential campaigns, here's the attitude you take. Sometimes you blow a debate. It's kind of like the Dolphins sometimes right. get blown out, and then the sure. next week they come back mm -hmm. and they have a commanding performance. The beauty for Bloomberg is he's got that chance on Tuesday in the next debate. But really, remember, he's trying to set the ground for Super Tuesday. That is his opportunity to come out and see if all of those unprecedented amounts that he is spending in the Super Tuesday states pay off. He's rising in the polls. He's now third nationally, and in some polls, he's second. He's actually overtaken Joe Biden. The question is, what is the effect with the other candidates that are not really showing that traction that could maybe get out and allow an anti-Sanders campaign yeah. to thrive? Ed Pizzoli, I just have to say, as the cliche goes, you only have one chance to make a first impression. 
Now, Michael Bloomberg bought $400 million worth of impressions, but that's all beautifully produced advertising. This yeah. was him live on stage with six other candidates, and he just didn't do well. Well, I, I do agree that one debate doesn't make a campaign, and particularly when you have the bankroll that he does. But does anybody see the irony in this billionaire, one of the richest men in the world, uh, trying to basically buy the nomination to the Democratic Party of the United States? But, I, I don't know. know. I, I think that's but, really you know. that's, that's really idea. ironic. It is really ironic to me. But but look, here, here's but wait, 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 the yeah. answer to that. Yeah. that. That's a narrative that yeah. people are framing him with. Sure. His narrative is, again, I have no horse in the race, just I've talked to him. <laughs> I'm spending a lot of my own money, he says, but everyone else is spending a and lot of no, everybody no, no, else's money. About it, but here's the issue. The bigger issue is, is that does the commercial, Mike Bloomberg that you see on the commercial, match up when you see him on the debate stage? And that's why the first impression well, really mattered. If, if, and it didn't. If, and it didn't. If, if debates were disqualifying, he never would have been elected three times as mayor of New York City. He's always had a reputation yeah, for not necessarily performing great in debates. Yeah. And he's a little bit, you know... Uh, Straight to the point when it comes to his style, but that's not, I think the question for Americans is who can beat Donald Trump? Right. We spent the and first part talking about Bernie Sanders. That's the challenge with Bernie Sanders. It makes the election, which should be a referendum on Trump, a referendum on socialism. And I think Bloomberg, Biden, any of the other candidates make it what it should be about, which is about the disastrous record. These first three and a half disastrous right. years where the rule of law is under assault by this criminal president. And what happened in November to make him hop in the race in the first place? What has been uninspiring amongst that entire stage? And I'm not the only person to think that the entire stage has been uninspiring when we know that people vote for people. We don't right. vote for whoever's going to be Donald Trump. We're voting for somebody. We think, and at least I think, that Bloomberg, if he gets the opportunity, will have a shot to beat Donald Trump. And we have a Supreme Court that's going to have a, a whole new makeup if you get another four years of Donald Trump. And I don't think even the Bernie bros and the Bernie sisters are going to enjoy the Supreme Court under Donald Trump if they stay home because they don't like the nominee that they got. But, but, they, but they want a revolution. But look, Sanders people want a revolution. But you know, you were reasonable up until the last couple statements. The, this idea, <laughs> this idea of, of Donald Trump Just has like a Trump. record. So he has reasonable. a record that that he can run on, and I think that there's a lot there. Unemployment, the economy that goes across the board, wage increases. We're out of the endless wars. You see the major things happening: trade, trade agreements happening. This is this is a four years of true policy activity that this president can stand and run on. Now, well, I will say, a, I will and, say this, and, I will say this, it does, the, the nature of it, I do agree with you, the nature of the campaign heading into November is in part dependent upon who he's going to run against. Yeah. So with Bernie Sanders, it is clear that in a, in, a, in a country that is as strong as ours, that has a great history as ours, and if you want to throw that all in the garbage can and start over with a socialist government, then that's fine. Bernie Sanders is your alternative. On the other hand, if it's somebody else like Mike Bloomberg, then at least you're going to have a debate about how capitalism works for everybody okay. and what, where that means. Could we talk about capitalism that. and the debate and post-Nevada, <laughs> pre-Florida in two minutes when we get right back. Stay tuned. Times has a fascinating article today about a 29-year-old assistant who has been brought in, who is now telling every department head and secretary, if you want to appoint somebody, if they're not a loyalist, we're going to fire them or get rid of them. But that's sort of the nature of the ancien regime here. What uh, happened in to Washington. Joe Biden that you wanted to talk about? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I got distracted here. But let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about Joe Biden and Stephen Johnson. I think 20% in the Nevada caucuses keeps him in the race. It's not great, but it sort of keeps Joe alive. I think it's, an, it's a testimony to his strength amongst black voters. I think he is still the leader to the black, the African-American population mm -hmm. and the African-American voter because you know what? We trust Joe and we really want the other guy out immediately. Isn't it though a generational split that we're starting to see, especially, you know, we're leaving for South Carolina this week for the primary there, starting to get into the polls and the splits and it looks generational because there are a lot of African-American young people who are staunchly behind Bernie Sanders. There right? are, and Bernie has an interest in putting up his African-American support up front because the only person who was doing worse with African-American voters was Pete Buttigieg. 
Um, but that is going to, I think, break away. I think once you send the folks from the churches into the polls, you are going to see, put us back to where we were. Give us back Uncle Joe. I love Uncle Joe. He's, he, I love Joe Biden for that reason. There is a, there's a safety and familiarity. Mm -hmm. We know him. We He's trust comfortable. him. comfortable. And, and you know what? Kamala Harris really put, put it on him at a debate, and he survived. She's not in the race anymore. He's still there, right? So at the end of the day, I think you're going to really see Joe Biden's black support. Now, you will see a split. I, I, I mentioned earlier, I've got a 20-something-year-old uh, nephew. He, he certainly sees his race totally different than I do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think your average voter is still going to go Joe, and Joe wins South Carolina. So how, how damaging then, Fernand, is the fact that there are all of, there's an Amy Klobuchar, and there's a Pete Buttigieg, and there's a Mike Bloomberg, and all of these moderate candidates splitting the moderate vote mm -hmm. in, the, in the first couple of states, and now calls for some of them that are still in the single or low double digits to get out, and, and they're saying, well, why should we? The race is so young. And then you have this momentum that creates news headlines that creates more momentum for a candidate. I mean, how, how damaging is that? It's a problem. Uh, over the last 20 years, the last four times we've had an open Democratic contest, by this point in the cycle, in 2000, 2004, 2008, 2016, it was down to a two-person race. And there's now six, maybe even seven, depending on how you look mm -hmm. at it, candidates that are well-financed and that they think they're viable. And a few that have e either gotten second place or more in some of these early contests, which makes it a challenge. But Michael was right about Joe Biden. It was almost a, a best or worst case scenario, depending on how you look at it. He limps into South Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, basically on fumes. He has to make a statement victory there. If he doesn't win the South Carolina primary going away by at least five or six points, Super Tuesday is not a week later, it's 72 hours later. Right. So that's where the challenge is for him. And I think at that point, then it is the moment of truth for Democrats on Super Tuesday. Do you stop the Bernie Sanders momentum and get behind a, one candidate? Or does Bernie just utilize this fractured environment and coast into Milwaukee as the presumptive nominee? Yeah. Well, I, I, would under, I think you're underestimating the organization of Sanders' campaign. I mean, put aside his political viewpoints, which I don't agree with. But the bottom line is that he's going to be organized in every state on Super Tuesday. And what Joe Biden, the question I have is if Joe Biden ends up winning South Carolina, whether it's by three or five or six points, I don't know if that matters much. He comes out of South Carolina with a win. The real question is on Super Tuesday, where do the moderate voter Democrats go? Do they go with Bloomberg given the rush of, of the amount of money, sheer amount of money he's spending? And or do they go with Joe Biden. He, he is a viable candidate. You, you talk about his money a lot, but take the money away. He's actually a viable if you take presidential the money away, candidate. If you take the money away, he's, he's sweeping streets in New York City. So let, let's understand but, this. But that's true for all of us. What I'm going to tell you, though, is that the voter is looking for someone to beat Donald Trump. And you have two choices, Bloomberg or Biden. Bernie you doesn't know, factor into that. Stephen, I'm going to have to jump in and say thanks. We are out of time. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very thank much. You. To be great, continued, great, great no round doubt. Table. All right, so to come, my personal perspective about that plea deal struck this week with Carmen Barahona. Why did it take nine years to get it? A personal perspective about the overly long and torturous fight to get justice for two little children who were tortured, starved, and beaten to death at their home in Westchester by the two monsters who had adopted them, Jorge and Carmen Barahona. Nubia, their adopted daughter, was just 10 years old when she died from the abuse her brother survived. On Friday, Carmen Barahona looked totally harmless, innocuous as she appeared in court <clears throat> without any advance notice to the media, and she meekly pled guilty to first-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. Looked like your grandma as she stood there, quietly pled guilty to those terrible charges. She'll spend the rest of her life in prison, which is where she belongs, and also agreed to testify against her husband, Jorge. State Attorney Catherine Rundle says it was Jorge Barahona principally responsible for torturing, starving, and killing 10-year-old Nubia, their adopted daughter. Nubia's twin brother, Victor, as I said, was subjected to the same abuse, but somehow he lived. This was a case that shocked the conscience of our community, tragically demonstrated just how flimsy the state's social safety net was for hundreds of adopted children. All this happened back in 2011, nine years ago.
So why are we only now getting a guilty plea from Carmen Barahona? I asked the state attorney that question on Friday. The unfortunate thing about these complicated cases is that they take a long time. They're complicated, they're, they're, their tentacles are broad, and they're deep. And the most important thing is to get a just resolution. Well, of course, a just resolution is the goal here, but why has it taken nine years to move this case forward? Yes, it is complicated, these cases usually are, but nine years is an absurdly long amount of time. The Barahonas have been locked up over that period, but that's beside the point. Justice delayed is justice denied, and Ms. Rundle has come perilously close to doing that. And why didn't she alert the public and the news media on Friday that Carmen Barahona was going to appear in court and enter that guilty plea? The Miami Herald was in the courtroom, good for them. Well, we should have been there too. All the media would have been there and would have been, except Kathy Rundle was secretive about this. Was she afraid Carmen Barahona would get cold feet, call off her plea deal if reporters and the public were in the courtroom? Well, if so, that is a chance Ms. Rundle should have taken. The Barahona's crime was not just against these poor children. It was against all of us. Don't shut us out and get a move on. That's my perspective for this week. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get online because you can catch any of our programs on local10.com. And while you're there, you can also subscribe online to our This Week in South Florida podcast.